The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, America's true heroes. They go to work in danger every day. Oliver North introduces us to everyday champions. These are people of, of great faith. And reveals what they all have in common. It's absolutely essential to carrying out the purpose that the good Lord put for us here. Then, I was just winning, winning, winning. A champion muscle man. The ego was blown away. Couldn't hardly get ahead through the door. Who couldn't strong arm his pain. The wealthier, the more successful I got, the more miserable I got. Hear what broke this bodybuilder. I saw who I really was. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The Democrats may be facing one of the longest, toughest primary battles ever. Former Vice President Joe Biden could be in for a difficult fight against Senator Bernie Sanders. Other Democrats are also pulling their party far to the left, and that could make it tough for Biden to win the nomination. Jennifer Wishon has the story. Joe Biden is a front runner among Democratic primary candidates, but holding on to his lead may prove to be the greatest fight of his life. Hey guys, we're we're just need a lane here. We just need a lane here. Come on, guys. This, okay? what are we here? Biden was right at home leaving a pizza joint in Delaware among a throng of reporters. But liberal voters will have to wait to find out where he stands on a variety of left wing causes like Medicare for All, the Green New Deal, and socialism in America. I gotta go. Justice Democrats, a progressive group aligned with New York's Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, labeled Biden part of the old guard, warning his political ideas could divide the party and suppress liberal enthusiasm. On day one of his campaign, his message sounded a lot like President Trump's slogan, make America great again. America's coming back like we used to be, ethical, straight. Telling the truth, moving in a way, supporting our allies, that, all those good things. The president dubbed Biden Sleepy Joe and quickly warned him in the primary he'll be dealing with people who truly have some very sick and demented ideas. I've known Joe over the years. He's not the brightest light bulb in the group, I don't think, but he has a name that they know. Name recognition he has, money he does not. That's a problem, considering the other Democratic leader, Bernie Sanders, is sitting on a war chest of more than $26 million as he works to rally Democrats to support his socialist agenda. Our job is not just to win the White House, it is to transform the economy and government of this country. For Biden to beat Bernie and the 18 other Democrats, he'll have to answer for 45 years of votes, public statements, and gaffes. For example, in the 70s, he opposed school busing and racial quotas. In the 90s, he was part of the tough on crime crowd. And as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, he presided over the Anita Hill hearings, controversial then and even more so today in the era of Me Too. Biden reached out to Hill in advance of his announcement, but Hill told the New York Times she was deeply unsatisfied with what he had to say. Biden hits the campaign trail in earnest Monday. First stop, Pittsburgh. I think Joe Biden's probably the best Democratic candidate that they have right now. Um, I'm, I'm a Republican, but I, I think that if, if somebody's going to vote Democrat, it's probably going to be Joe Biden. I think his time is over for, for running for president. I don't think he has it. I think we need someone younger, uh, someone with better ideas. See you guys. Keep the faith. In Pennsylvania, Biden will play up his reputation as a scrappy politician, popular among working class voters, workers enjoying record low unemployment under President Trump. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, we now have 20 candidates. Get that 20 candidates for 2020. Uh, and uh, it, it, I remember back growing up that there actually used to be a gap between elections and you could actually focus on governing the country. But it just seems like we're into one continuous campaign after another. Uh, there's going to be a free for all here and we'll, we'll be reporting and stay tuned. In other news, the key figure in those Easter terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka is dead. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? 
Thanks, Gordon. Officials in Sri Lanka say Mohamed Zahran, the suspected leader of the group they say carried out those terrorist attacks, was killed. He died in a blast at one of the hotels that was bombed, and police have arrested Zahran second in command. Sri Lanka's prime minister said militants may be planning more attacks. Well, they've rounded up a lot of suspects, but there are still some of the active people on the run. <clears throat> they may be having explosives with them, or they may have hidden the explosives, so we have to find the uh, suspects as well as the explosives. So that's still on. Australia's Prime Minister says the attackers were supported by ISIS. Jews and Christians are calling out Democrat Ilhan Omar of Minnesota for promoting the idea that Jesus was a Palestinian and not a Jew living in Roman-occupied Judea. The Minnesota Congresswoman faced backlash after she retweeted a tweet from Omar Suleiman, an American Muslim scholar and civil rights activist, accusing conservative Christians of being ignorant about Jesus' quote, Palestinian heritage. Michael Dixon, executive director of Stand With Us Israel, tweeted, no, Ilhan Omar, Jesus was not a Palestinian. He was a Jew born in Israel under Roman occupation. And your need to misrepresent history and misappropriate his background to further a political cause says more about you than it does about anything else. Well, severe weather, including several tornadoes, ripped, through, ripped a path of destruction across the south, killing at least five people before moving north. A twister tore the roof off this Ohio barn with its powerful winds. In Louisiana, the small town of Ruston was hit by another tornado, packing 136 mile an hour winds. Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards declared a state of emergency and says search and rescue is a priority, as well as making sure bridges and overpasses are safe and beginning cleanup. Well, the United Nations has called the exodus of Venezuelan refugees unparalleled in the modern history of South America. More than a million of the country's four million refugees have fled to the neighboring nation of Colombia, where many had an encounter with Jesus Christ over Easter weekend. Charlene Aaron has that story. A broken economy magnified by a political crisis and power outages is forcing millions of Venezuelans to flee their country. CBN correspondent Chuck Holton has described the desperate situation for those crossing into the border town of Cucuta, Colombia. So this is the illegal way to get across from Venezuela into Colombia. It's called La Trocha. These guys are bringing products either into Colombia to sell or back into Venezuela, things that aren't available there, things like tires, things like medicines. Coming across from Venezuela, we're seeing a lot of scrap metal that they sell over in the Colombian side. We see things like copper wire because people are ripping the wires out of the walls and wrapping them up and bringing them over here to sell just to get enough money to eat. Prostitution by Venezuelan girls is rampant. Lionel Castillo and his wife work with their church to help them. The wealthiest Venezuelans have already escaped to Spain or Miami. The middle class is going to Ecuador or Chile. But the poorest and most vulnerable are coming to Cucuta. Venezuelans have been suffering under one of the worst humanitarian disasters in modern times. But this week, tens of thousands of refugees received the ultimate gift of hope. Tonight, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, tonight you can be sure. It was called the Festival of Hope, and the Graham team chose the strategic location of Cucuta to share the gospel to Colombians and Venezuelan refugees as well. The physical needs, I think, of the people, uh, God sometimes uses that to open up the hearts spiritually. Christian ministries like Graham's Samaritan's Purse and CBN's Operation Blessing have sent teams to provide food, hygiene kits, and medical care to the refugees. As the humanitarian crisis worsens, the U.S. and other nations are increasing pressure on the Maduro government and his allies, Russia and Cuba. Graham considers the Cuban officials and military personnel who are propping up leader Nicolas Maduro a big obstacle to change. It's really the Cubans. Uh, the Cubans have taken control of the country. And uh, they have taken control of this government. They've taken control of the military. It's almost like uh, Cuba has annexed the country. As the Venezuela crisis deepens, the U.S. and other nations aren't ruling out military force. Graham says he hopes and prays for a solution that does not involve military force and more suffering for the Venezuelan people. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Gordon, that humanitarian aid, a bright spot in the middle of so much desperation. Well, the desperation is demanding it. Uh, just imagine a million people leaving their country 
uh, uh, just because they can't eat. And, and we need to be there for them. And we're, we're there. Operation Blessing is there. We're there in your name. But congratulations to Franklin. What a wonderful idea. Let's not just give humanitarian aid. Let's also give them the gospel. Let's give them hope for tomorrow. Terry? Well, up next, Oliver Nurth talks about what it takes to be a real American hero. You know, you say the word hero and somebody has visions of somebody wearing a spandex suit and a cape. My heroes wear flak jackets and combat boots and flight suits and, and they carry guns and badges and they go to work in danger every day. Colonel North explores the connection between heroes and faith in his new TV series. We'll tell you more about it when we come back. Well, Americans love heroes, and Oliver North loves heroes, too. Colonel North has a new TV series highlighting heroes that explores two questions. What does it take to be a hero, and what role does a person's faith play? CBN's Jennifer Wishon brings us that story. As a Marine and son of war veterans, Colonel Oliver North says he spent most of his life in the company of heroes. Now as president of the National Rifle Association, he's taking his passion for telling their stories to NRA TV. And so far, each episode of Oliver North's American Heroes highlights men and women of faith facing risk to help others. I mean, the Bible is full of heroes. And you see the purpose of that being related to us is to inspire us to be better than we otherwise might be. He's shining light on people like Jason Brown, a pro football player turned farmer. Jason Brown was the highest paid center that ever played in the NFL. And he looked at himself in the mirror one morning and he said, you know, I'm, I'm making all this money. I've got the fame, I've got the fortune. He's got the size, as you can tell, and said, I need to do something to give back. CBN News also caught up with Brown at his first fruits farm, where he grows food for people in need. His faith is palpable. He doesn't wear it on his sleeve. But what he does with his faith is show the, res the, the, the kind of response that you get to the opportunities the good Lord puts in front of you. You know, one of the things that strikes me about Jason Brown is the clarity and commitment he has to what he's been called to do. Are those common traits among heroes? Commitment is something that's absolutely essential to carrying out the purpose that the good Lord put for us here on this earth. In his most recent episode, North highlights the heroic duty of Tanner Primer. The video you have of Tanner Primer is difficult to watch. It is. I mean, you, if you know what's about to happen, here, and this is a maritime deputy sheriff. And down at Cape Canaveral, this is where he's based, there's a very narrow ship channel to get those enormous cruise ships in and out. And you can see it on the video. The pilot sounds the horn that there's danger. Two girls have fallen off a jet ski. And he takes his boat right in front of the cruise ship, which can't stop. And you see that shadow coming up an extraordinary act of heroism. There's a moving part of that episode where you get emotional. Do you pray? I do, every day. I asked her if she prayed. And I told her a story about uh, what a wife had told me uh, when we were in the armor business. I made armor, my, my patents are in armor. And, uh, and it, we both got choked up about it. but. That's another common characteristic of all of these. These are people of, of great faith. But North fears these days the word hero doesn't mean as much. You know, you say the word hero and somebody has visions of somebody wearing a spandex suit and a cape. And my heroes wear flak jackets and combat boots and flight suits and, and they carry guns and badges and they go to work in danger every day. And he considers keeping company with them one of the great blessings of his life. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Uh, today we need hero, heroes more than ever. And to find out how you can watch episodes of Oliver, Oliver North's American Heroes on NRA TV, just go to CBNNews.com. Terry? Coming up, a bodybuilder with a short fuse chases a man into a phone booth. He thought he was safe because of unbreakable glass. And I said, not with me. I punched right through that glass like it was nothing. I cut all nine tendons, the nerve, and the artery to my right hand. 
See how his injury leads this man to the brink of suicide after this. When he was 56, Stephen Buttrick weighed 380 pounds and was living on disability. His life was a far cry from the days he was an ego-driven champion bodybuilder. So far that Stephen decided to drink himself to death, but he never got the chance. The outdoors has always been a place of solace for Stephen Buttrick. As a young boy growing up in rural Michigan, it was his escape. I was either in fear or I was by myself. Outside is all I had, that was my playground. Outside was a safe place from his abusive father. Stephen's parents divorced when he was five. He blamed himself for the divorce and his father's fits of anger. So I just didn't feel adequate, didn't feel worth a thing. No one wanted Stephen around is what I, how I felt. You know, I manufactured my own world. A world where Stephen was at the center. Throughout adolescence and into adulthood, Stephen worked to prove his worth as a man. Manhood was working and making a living. Pretty much that was it, you know? I mean, work hard, play hard. I became very good at that, very good. Playing hard also meant drinking, fighting, and showing others he was the better man. By his early 20s, Stephen was a husband to Pamela, a father, and starting a career in sales. He also found something else to bolster his growing ego, competitive bodybuilding. Again, he worked to be the best. You know, I was just winning, 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 and the ego was blown away. Couldn't hardly get ahead through the door. His growing confidence also boosted his success in medical sales. While Stephen never liked the confines of an office or a suit and tie, the money and the praise seemed to make up for it, except for one thing. The wealthier, the more successful I got, the more miserable I got. That's because Stephen still had the heart of a hurting, angry boy. Lack of self-esteem, didn't think I was worth anything. So when I found out that I could do these things and achieve them, I thought by achieving them, it would help me, put me up here where I was okay now. Then one night while Stephen was out drinking at a bar, a man made a passing comment about his wife. It was enough to set Stephen off, and he chased the man into a phone booth. He thought he was safe because unbreakable glass, and I said, not with me. I punched right through that glass like it was nothing. Cut all nine tendons, the nerve, and the artery to my right hand. The injury ended his seven-year bodybuilding career. Now in a job he hated and no outlet for his anger and hurt, Stephen started drinking more often. I was feeling good and I wanted it to continue. I didn't want it to go away. It was suppressing all the depression, anxiety, and the thoughts of, I never wanted to be a salesman. I don't like being a salesman. Eventually, Stephen was drinking every day. Now a functional alcoholic, he was trying to hold on to his fragile ego. I would treat my wife badly, and she darn well had better taken care of everything I needed. And if things went wrong, I couldn't blame myself because I did no wrong. Anything I did was okay, you know, because I was the man. By 2012, after some 20 years, Stephen had lost numerous jobs. His marriage was in shambles, and his health was deteriorating. At 56, he weighed in at 380 pounds and was living on disability. That's my fault. All I could think about was just keeping myself from sobering up so I didn't have to deal with the reality. And I looked at myself and I didn't see anybody I recognized. It was then Stephen decided to drink himself to death, but he never got the chance. On March 15th, 2012, after his morning vodka, he heard a voice. You're not you. You're trying to destroy yourself. Your life is not yours to take. In a moment of clarity, Stephen knew that voice was God's. I called out, God help me. Don't let me die like this. Looking like this, thinking like this, everybody knowing me like this. That's the legacy I was going to leave. I called out, don't let me die. Well, I saw who I really was and become. And I said, Lord Jesus, what do I do? I feel your unconditional love and I surrender unconditionally. 
Stephen put down the bottle and picked up a Bible. That started him on a journey to healing his body, his heart, and his broken relationships. He gave me self-worth, that I had a responsibility to my wife, my children, my family, the community that knew me. Long since retired, he's reconciled with his wife and family and made his life in the outdoors, finding solace and a father's love. I didn't think I was worthy. And that miracle, God told me that you're worth more than you know. You are worth more than you know. You're worth the price that Jesus paid for you. He laid down his life. That's his unconditional love. And the Apostle Paul called it, this is love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he die? Because you are so worth it for him. He wants to spend all eternity with you. That's why he laid down his life. Isaiah says it, it's in the 53rd chapter, when he offers his soul as a sacrifice for sin, he will see his descendants and his soul will be satisfied. You satisfy Jesus when you say yes. Yes, Lord, come into my life. Make me new again. Make me what you originally intended me to be because that is what he paid for. That is the life he paid for. Now, if you're like Steve and, and you've given up and you, and you say there's, there's no point, well, here's the point. God has a hope and a purpose for you. He has plans for you. He created good things for you to walk into. He wants to satisfy the desires of your heart he wants to give you all of these things. And then most importantly, he wants to give you eternity, eternity with him. If you want this, all you have to do is do the same thing Stephen did. Lord, I receive your unconditional love and I give my life unconditionally to you. If you're ready to do that, bow your head with me. Let's pray a very simple prayer. And what you saw Jesus do for Stephen, he'll do for you. He'll transform you. He'll give you worth. He'll give you purpose. He'll give you joy. He'll give you life if you just ask for it. Pray with me. Jesus. That's right. Say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus. I receive your unconditional love. And Jesus, I unconditionally give my life to you. I don't want to live it my way anymore. I want to live it your way. So Jesus, I open my heart to you and I ask that you come in. I ask that you forgive me of all the things that I've done wrong, that you make me new again. And Jesus, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Answer it now, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Father, I ask right now for a baptism in your spirit, a baptism in your love. Let them know that their prayer has been heard and has been answered today. Do it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. So give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got something for you. It's called A New Day, and there's a CD teaching of what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? There's also a booklet filled with Bible verses. It's all free. There's no financial obligation at all. We want you to know what to do now. What are the next steps you need to do to live the Christian life? So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry, over to you. Still ahead, a code blue at a hospital after a mother with blood clots, flat lines on the table. The situation's about as bad as it can get. She is on life support at maximum everything. 
and her blood pressure is not really high enough to sustain life. So how did she walk out of the hospital and why is she healthier today than ever before? You'll find out later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Canada's Mint unveiled an official dollar coin this week honoring progress for LGBTQ people. The coin marks 50 years since homosexuality was decriminalized. But some gay activists say the country still has far to go, and conservative Christians called it highly offensive and an attack on their faith. Well, Operation Blessing is helping the sick and poor in Peru. Juana has dedicated her life to creating pottery and ceramics in the Peruvian community of Padre Cocha. But when she began providing for her grandsons, she struggled due to a lack of supplies and poor quality equipment that were a danger to her health. But Juana and her grandson both got the tests and treatments they needed at an Operation Blessing supported medical clinic. OB Peru also provided her with ample supplies to increase her business and with lessons to learn new techniques. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting its website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Brenda is known as mother to 90 orphans in Uganda. She was once an orphan herself living on the streets. So when Brenda was diagnosed with cancer, she worried about what would become of her children. But not anymore, thanks to Orphan's Promise. As the rain falls in Uganda, Brenda and her 90 children take shelter in their new home. Orphans Promise helped them move here after their previous landlord gave them an eviction notice. The old house was really run down. The landlord was a Muslim and didn't like that we were praying and singing gospel songs. At times, we only had one meal each day or nothing at all. Brenda was used to having hardship in her life. When she was young, she lost both her parents and lived on the streets. I don't want any child to go through what I went through. With the help of Orphan's Promise, Brenda provides children here with a safe home, three meals per day, and an opportunity to get an education. Seeing them happy brings me so much joy. On Sundays, we sit under the tree and talk about God's goodness and what He has done for us. All of the wonderful work Brenda does almost came to an end when she got breast cancer. I had painful headaches and felt sick most of the time. When the doctors told me I had cancer, I didn't even know what that was. They said I needed immediate surgery, but there was no way I could afford it. When we learned about Brenda's illness, we covered all her medical bills, including multiple surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Today, she is cancer free. Nothing is impossible for God. Because you saved my life, you saved the lives of all my children too. Without you, they'd all be back on the streets and have no one to take care of them. Now, I can give them a life I never had. Thank you, CBN, and thank you, CBN Partners. May God bless all of you abundantly. just want to say thank you to Brenda. She is an amazing woman. She's a young woman, and yet here she is taking on the responsibility of all these children because she once was there. You know, if you're a 700 Club member, you are contributing to this kind of work around the world. Orphans Promises, CBN's outreach to vulnerable and orphan children. And we want to say thank you for making it possible for us to step into scenarios like you just saw with Brenda. Maybe it's children who have no opportunity for education. We're able to build schools. We're able to bring in teachers, curriculum, educate children. Lots of kids don't have clean water to drink or food to eat. You make that possible as well. It's just 
one of the things you do when you join the 700 Club. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. So will you join with the rest of us today if you haven't done that already? So simple. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. And when you call, would you do it using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It's pretty special. All you do is is pray because your bank does all the work. They do it for you every month and it saves us some uh, administrative costs so we can put even more of your gift right into the work of people like Brenda all around the world. So call our number when you use Pledge Express. We want to send you a Power for Life teaching. You'll get one every month and we think it'll be a blessing to you even as you are blessing other people. So again, it's 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club and I want to do it using Pledge Express. We say thank you. Gordon. Well, up next, a walking miracle who defied all her doctor's predictions. No one has ever seen anyone in her situation walk out of a hospital. Never. Not before, not since. Never. Watch how this woman's supernatural healing unfolds right after this. For 14 minutes inside St. Anthony's Hospital in Oklahoma, Julie Britton was practically dead. Her heart had stopped, she suffered a stroke, and her internal organs were shutting down. Not surprisingly, doctors said the situation was as bad as it could get, but there was one thing working in Julie's favor, the 50 prayer warriors in the waiting room. In the early hours of June 12, 2013, 16-year-old Reagan Britton woke up and was unable to go back to sleep. I was just wide awake, and then I get a phone call. And it's my mom. And all she says is, help me, I can't breathe. Reagan raced down the hall where she found her mom, Julie, a smoker and asthmatic, gasping for air. I had a constant prayer going in my head, like, please, God, please help me. She just looked like she was about to pass out or something, so I called 911. Paramedics arrived to take Julie to the ER at St. Anthony's Hospital in Shawnee, Oklahoma. Before he left for the ambulance, Reagan's father, Michael, told Reagan and her twin sister, Jordan, to stay with their brother, Bauer. Our dad said, just give us an hour. She'll be fine. We'll be back soon. Don't wake your brother up. But at the hospital, things were far from okay. Julie's lungs weren't responding to treatment. As she was getting breathing treatments, she worsened. And as she worsened, her oxygen levels plummeted. And when they plummeted, she passed out and they had to start doing basically a code blue. The medical team moved Julie to the ICU, where she coded three more times and had a stroke. Her friend of nearly 20 years, charge nurse Kelly Schock, was on duty. I was right there, you know, doing the compressions and I was saying goodbye to her. It was right at 10 minutes, we got her back again. And at this point, what little hope I had, had gone to none. Julie's family and friends gathered at the hospital and started praying. Some of it was just, please God, help us out, please. Like, we know you're watching, we know you're with us, please. Then they learned Julie had developed disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC a condition that was causing her blood to clot abnormally. Typically people don't live through that because they ha can have a massive stroke uh, where they throw a clot to their brain and I gave her very little chance to live. The situation's about as bad as it can get. She is on life support at maximum everything and her blood pressure is not really high enough to sustain life. Dr. Blair struggled with breaking the news, not just to Julie's family, but to his own. I've known Julie for, at this point, 10 years. And when my children's mother died, Julie was one of the biggest support systems for my kids. So, <laughs> Julie's twins were instrumental in keeping my twins sane 
through that time, probably helping keep me sane through that time. I knew that I now needed to tell my kids again that one of their biggest support systems and their best friend's mom is gonna die. <laughs> they said, your mom's not gonna make it if she codes again. Go in there and say your goodbyes. And we said, no, she's gonna make it. Because um, we knew God was looking out for us. While the family stayed by Julie's side, more than 100 people from the close-knit community of Shawnee gathered in the waiting room and hallways of the ICU to show their support and pray. People would pray together, people would pray separately, or just people from church would come and just sit there and pray with us for hours. When I walked out of the intensive care unit and find 50 people in the waiting room, all believing in the power of prayer. <laughs> and all believing that somehow she was gonna be okay. I'll tell you, that's uh, it's amazing. Julie lived through the night, but doctors didn't hold out much hope for her recovery. Her sternum and ribs were broken from the CPR, so she couldn't breathe on her own. Her kidneys had also shut down. After she made it through the first night, they started saying, you need to prepare. She, we know she made it through the first night, but there is a large chance she'll be in a vegetative state. Julie was put into a medically induced coma and transferred to St. Anthony's Hospital in Oklahoma City for dialysis. There, Dr. Blair coordinated a team of nearly a dozen doctors assigned to her care. By now, people all over the country were praying. Julie's DIC resolved and over the next few weeks, she continued to improve. Every step she took in a positive direction, I, was, I knew that was God. Finally, her kidneys started working again. After nearly a month in a coma, Julie woke up. I woke up and I had no idea how long I had been there. I had no idea what had happened. I had no idea what my family and friends had been through. Julie says the one thing she does remember was being with Jesus. I cannot put into words where I was or the joy and the peace and the calm that I felt. There's no chaos. It was indescribable. After three difficult months, Julie made a stunning recovery and walked out of the hospital. Today, her heart, lung, and kidney functions are all back to normal, and she has been completely delivered from her addiction to smoking. Julie and those she loves credit her survival to one thing, prayer. It was a miracle that she's up and walking and smiling and laughing. I do not think she would be here today if it wasn't for those prayers. Everyone I know and people that I didn't know praying for me is the only reason that I'm here. And all the people that I've spoken to in her case, no one has ever seen anyone in her situation walk out of a hospital. Never, not before, not since, never. Julie cherishes each new day and her deeper relationship with Jesus. Jesus is guiding you, but you have to stop and listen. I believe that God stripped us of everything except for each other and prayer. And so the only thing that we had to look to was Him. I find it so interesting that Julie said when she was in that place where she knew Jesus was present, the chaos was gone. And then she says, God's talking to us all of the time, but we have to stop and be willing to listen. You know, we all have things that we want God to touch and to do in our lives. And lots of times we just expect Him to sort of intervene in the midst of our crazy chaotic mess. He wants us to stop and listen because when we do, we focus on how great He is, how big He is, how able He is, how available He is. And He is listening for you and I, even as we listen for Him. Prayer changes things. It's why we pray on this program. It changes the impossible, things that man cannot account for. God can step into the midst of and make a difference. I know you have needs in your life today. They may not be as severe as Julie's needs were, 
But God hears it all. The Bible says not a sparrow falls from the tree, but that he sees it. So we want to pray for you today. But first, to further build your faith, I want to share with you a story of Marion from Murfreesboro, North Carolina. She had knee trouble accompanying terrible pain for 30 years, which also included gout and alarming growths. Even after surgeries, the growths and overall gunk were present. One day as Marion watched this program, she heard both Gordon and me pray, describing her knee being completely restored. When she went for her next MRI, it showed her knee was completely cleaned out. Yay. Only God. Yay, God. <laughs> Amen. Here's Naomi of Hinesville, Georgia. She walked with a cane, hunched over. She was only 63, but was diagnosed with degenerative disc and psoriatic arthritis. Well, back on April 19th, 2019, just a few days ago, Naomi watched the 700 Club, heard Terry pray. There's someone else that needs the same creative miracle. It's your lower back, the very bottom of your spine that connects to your tailbone. You've got vertebra that are missing the padding in between. It's so painful you for you. God is healing that for you today, right now, in a creative way. Just receive it and be made whole. Well, Naomi be believed and now is no longer in pain, does not need her cane, and stands completely straight. Yay, Yay God. God. Yay, God. <laughs> Nothing is impossible with God. Let that story you just watched encourage you. Nothing is impossible for God. With men, things are impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. So let's reach out and touch his infinite possibility. We can do that. We have the grace to do that, to go boldly to the throne of grace and receive the answer to our prayer. Now, we're going to agree, believing. You join with us. And the Bible says when two or more agree, touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So let's just believe God and let's agree. And you reach out and touch. So lay a hand on that area of the body that needs healing. We'll agree with you. You do the touching. We'll do the agreeing and God will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we just reach out with, with faith to you. And we ask that you would reach out and touch those who need healing today. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong to those whose hearts are loyal to you. And so, Lord, as we lay hands, we're showing you we're loyal to you. We believe in your unfailing love. We believe for the impossible because with you all things are possible. So stretch forth your hand to do miracles, to do wonders, to restore, to heal, to make new again. And we ask it now in Jesus name. Uh, there's someone, your name is Agnes and you've got trouble with your right jaw. Just open your mouth wide and realize you have been completely healed. You just felt a touch go through that joint and all the way back up into your ear. And God has just completely restored it completely made it new. And, and there's several people, you've got a uh, deteriorating bone in your jaw and your teeth are getting loose and God is able to heal and restore. And all of that is being taken away. And now in Jesus name, be healed and be made whole. Terry? Now, there's someone you're watching and listening right now and praying with us and you are very filled with fear because you've been experiencing so much mental confusion and you're very afraid of what that means. God is restoring all of your ability to think with clarity and you're not going to have any of this anymore. No more jumbled thinking, no more not remembering why or where you are. You haven't told anybody about this, but from this day forth, you'll not have it again in Jesus' name. Um, I think there are many right now who are suffering with torment as a result of sexual abuse from your childhood. And it's like the memory just torments you and, and, and you get back into a helpless state and, and, and you're, you just need deliverance from it now. In Jesus' name, be delivered from the torment now. Be delivered from the fear. Be delivered from the shame. 
in Jesus' name, be set free from this and be renewed in your innermost being in every part of your body, soul, spirit, heart, and mind. Be renewed by the power of God. Be set free from this to live a life of joy and, and happiness, looking forward to your future, knowing your future is with him. Be set free from this in Jesus' name. There's someone else. You have a strange condition. I don't know if there's a name for this or not, but your, your saliva glands don't work anymore, so your mouth is constantly dry. It's changed your ability to eat certain foods, to swallow it. Just everything is affected by it. God's restoring that to you right now. You're just going to feel your mouth become moist again. You're going to be able to eat. You're going to be able to speak clearly. All of that discomfort is gone in Jesus' name. So when you have a ruptured uh, blood vessel in your right eye, and um, it, it's just being healed. It's being taken away and your eyes are gonna be clear uh, from this point forward. Everything is going to be normal. Your vision's normal, everything's normal. Everything's healed, been, been restored now in Jesus' name. All that pain, all discomfort leave you now in the name of Jesus. Nodules in the throat gone in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you are the healer, you are the deliverer. You came to cleanse us. You came to set us free. You came to heal us. And most importantly, you came to save us. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you have been touched by God, share your good report. We're here for you. And realize God wants to heal. God wants to set free. God wants to deliver. God wants to save. And he's only a prayer away. All you have to do is reach out and touch. Jesus said it so clearly, the kingdom of God is at hand. That means it's right here. The time is fulfilled. That means it's right now. Change your thinking and believe the good news. We can believe it now that he died for us. He set us free. So if you need prayer, call us 1-800-700-7000 and just tell us what you need, and it's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. Here's a word from Luke chapter 5, verse 17, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. For Terry, for me, for all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.